God, you are good when there is seemingly nothing good in this world. God, we, we proclaim that today. God, in so many things that have happened this last week, God, in, with the tragedy in Vegas and with the passing of loved ones so dear to uh, this church family, God, we know that you are still God. who need to know the goodness of you, God, in your love, and that you are good. God, I just ask today that you would, you would be in this place working in our hearts and in our minds, Lord, with, with Pastor Fred's words, God, that they would be yours to preach the goodness of you. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Church, you may be seated. turn that on, it might help. Let's try it again. Good morning. Can you see me? All right, just want to make sure, just want to make sure you can see where I'm at. We are taking our ride today after the second service about noon. We'll be, uh, hopefully around noon, we'll be taking off for those of you that are riding with us today. When you ride a motorcycle, you want people to see you. You know what I'm saying? So uh, that's what we're doing today. And uh, place we were going to in Richmond. I was told on Monday uh, of last week that it burnt down this week. <laughs> it's like, we shouldn't be going on this ride. It poured rain one time. The place where we're going to eat lunch is burnt down. But uh, we are going to end up in Bait City at Bait City Barbecue. Mm, mm, going to be good. Who's hungry? Already hungry. Before we get into the message, for many of you uh, already know, some of you may not, that our former uh, worship pastor, David Grimm, lost his battle with cancer this week. Uh, I believe he's only 43 years old, two small children, and uh, our hearts really do ache for his family. I think it would only be fitting that we pause now and just remember his family in prayer. As God's people gather, we pray together, right? And that's what we do. And I... I don't know. I, you know, when I grew up in church, we would often hold hands during prayer, and I, I always hated that because the person next to me always had sweaty palms, like a wet wash rag hand, and, <laughs> and uh, such. But I, I tell you what, I would like to do. Could we, as a church today, could we just stand and just kind of move together as we pray? And you can hold hands if you like. And uh, but we just kind of gather together. And let's pray together. You can move across the aisle if you want to. I have to tell you from up here, it looks great. It really does. It, it looks good. Let's pray together. Father, we, we pause what we're doing and we do declare that you are God alone. There is no one beside you. You exist as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have always existed in your circle of love and your circle of fellowship. And out of your love, you created us in order to share in your life. We are grateful. But Father, as we await your coming kingdom in its fullness as we await the coming kingdom that will, will take place here on this earth and we will forever, ever be with you. Until then, we face so many ups and downs and we face things here that sometimes we don't understand. We know that they hurt. And Father, we think of uh, Marla and Addie and Josiah this morning. The loss of their husband and their their daddy. And Father, I know that it touches the hearts of many here out of their love for the Grimm family, but also it sometimes causes us to remember pain and hurt in our own life. Your word says that you are the God of all comfort. And we come together this morning 
and we ask you to comfort the Grimm family, Corrine as well, the mom, um, the entire family and friends and church that they were a part of. And comfort our hearts. Give us a peace that passes all understanding. It's too big for us to understand. We give it to you. Knowing that you, through your death, defeated death. We claim our hope in you. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we are going to continue in our series, Everybody Loves David. But what I'd like to do today, in light of the circumstances that we have been facing as a nation, I'm actually going to skip ahead in the life of David a little bit. And I want to go to a story in his life. Matter of fact, I actually preached this very message back in 2015. Uh, I titled this message, When the Unthinkable Happens. What to do on the worst day of your life. And we've seen that as a nation, as Joel referenced earlier this past Sunday in Las Vegas. 59 people lost their lives. And I think we had, I thought we had some pictures of some of that. Um, but uh, in Vegas, yeah, well, that's uh, not Vegas, but there we go. Uh, 59 people uh, lost their, their lives. Uh, one story, several stories from this tragedy. One was story of an emergency room nurse in Tennessee by the name of Sonny Melton. He was attending the concert with his wife who happened to be an orthopedic surgeon. They'd come from Tennessee to go to this concert. His wife recalls that when the bullets rang out, her husband protected her with his own body and lost his life. And those kind of stories throughout that entire tragedy, unthinkable. And then, yes, we've had the hurricanes. We had Hurricane Harvey in Houston. And uh, Hurricane Harvey in Houston actually dropped 50 inches of rain in that area. And then, of course, uh, was it Irma in Florida with uh, 185 mile an hour winds on uh, uh, parts of Florida. And then, of course, in Puerto Rico, uh, Maria and the devastation. And now Nate is hitting uh, parts of Alabama and Mississippi as we speak. And there's incredible devastation and loss. The pictures, you can see the incredible devastation. It's, it's the unthinkable. It's the worst day of their lives. A couple of weeks ago in Lee Summit, at Lee Summit North, a young lady went to the second floor of her high school and in a bathroom there in Lee Summit North committed suicide. The worst day of their lives, families, when they got that news... And then, of course, when we think of David, we think of 43 years old and two children, about 10 years old and under, a living wife. I mean, how do you go on from that? And I know that oftentimes we ask questions if we're on the outside looking in. We look at the tragedies and things like this, and we start asking, why does this happen? Why does this happen? But when, when it's happening to you, you're not necessarily asking, why does this happen? You're asking, how do I get through it? Am I going to be able to make it another day? How do I get through this? When the unthinkable happens, when you experience the worst day of your life, how do you go on? And I really do believe that this story from the life of David will provide us with some hope and some encouragement and some wisdom when we face those days that are dark and dreary and confusing. So we're going to be actually focusing in chapter 30 of 1 Samuel today, if you would like to join us there. And uh, basically, I need to set this up because we're jumping ahead, and we'll actually come back and pick up where we left off and kind of fill in this gap. But here's kind of where we're to kind of bring you up to date where the story is going to actually take place today. Um, David is actually on the run for his life 
from King Saul. Do you remember that David has won the incredible victory over Goliath? The crowds are singing, Saul slain his thousands, David slain his tens of thousands. Saul is incredibly jealous, and he's actually taking a spear. And last week we saw that he attempted to kill David twice, and he actually adds a third one. David actually goes back into that environment, and Saul does it again. Three times, David's on the run. What else can he do? What else can he do? And we find David running, and, it's, and he's running from Saul, and Saul is relentless trying to capture David and kill him because Saul knows David's going to be the next king. And he doesn't want to be replaced. And his anger has just consumed him. And so David is running for his life because Saul has the power of the army with him. And David actually ends up staying in caves. Matter of fact, when we were in Israel, we, we went and traveled to a place where you could look up into the mountains and you could see caves. And these are some of the caves where David and his men would stay. And by the way, it was a perfect place to hide because when you didn't have the weapons and the vehicles that we have today, you couldn't get up there. I mean, it was like this perfect place to hide. And you say, David and his men. Well, you have to understand that when David started running, men started attaching themselves to David. And actually, the Bible says 600 men have come to David. 600. Can, how, can you imagine hiding with 600 men? <laughs> down, down. <laughs> There's David. And by the way, they're married and they have children. Those are probably closer to 2,000 people. The Bible says these were men who were discontented, unhappy, in debt, and they were running from the government as well. And we come to this verse in chapter, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 27. We need to go back to verse 1. Do we have verse 1? There we go. But David, and I want you to say these words with me, but David, say this right here, kept thinking to himself. I say it again. But David kept thinking to himself. Someday Saul's going to get me. The best thing I can do is escape to the... Where? Now, didn't David just win a great battle over the... And that's where he's going? And so he goes to the Philistines. Then Saul will stop hunting for me in, in uh, Israelite territory. And I will finally be safe. And in verse number 2... It says, David took his 600 men and went over and joined Achish, son of Maok, the king of Gath. Now, here's what's funny about the king of Gath. If you look in 1 Samuel chapter 17, I believe it's verse 4, do you want to know what city Goliath was from? Gath. David goes and runs to the city where Goliath, it's Goliath's hometown. He probably, when he came into town, there were probably billboards with Goliath's picture on it. <laughs> Champion Goliath. And this is the guy who killed, that's where David's going. Go back to verse 1. Can we pull verse 1 back up on the screen? But David kept thinking to himself. You want to know what was so, so powerful about David when we first meet him and are introduced to him? It's how close he is to God and how he relies upon God as his strength and his source. And when he goes out to fight Goliath, he knows he's going to beat Goliath because he's prayed about it. He knows God wants him to go and God's going to give him the victory. How many of you sense something different in David right now? You see, David's no longer really praying and seeking God. He's thinking to himself. And by the way, when you and I try to strategize and figure out life ourselves, we're going to end up in a mess. I'm going to say that again because you didn't like it. <laughs> no, honestly, you see, what David is doing, and I wonder, I wonder if David is thinking with Saul chasing him every day, he's running for his life. I wonder if David's just tired of it. And I wonder if David is thinking to himself, can't pray to God because he's not there. I mean, God's not helping me. God's not delivering me. And so I feel like maybe I just need to take care of everything myself. And so, hey, by the way, you don't have to raise your hand because we're in church and I don't, you know, don't want you to look bad. Have you ever felt like God's abandoned you? 
Have you ever just, things just seem to be piling up and you feel like God's abandoned you? And that seems to be what's happening to David here because he's thinking to himself and he's trying to figure out himself. And so he comes up with a plan to go to the Philistine country and there he'll be safe from Saul. And so he does and they receive him. They take him. The, the king and David become buddies. The king of Gath, I don't know. I think David might have went and said, maybe he, maybe he said, I made a big mistake and the Israelites have turned against me and I want to come and I want to serve you. And they're probably thinking, you're the greatest soldier on the planet. We would love to have you here. And David said, hey, I don't want to live in the big town. I'd like to live in a little country town. And so they give him a city to live in. The city is called Ziklag. He's from Ziklag. And that's where he and his family and the men that were with him and their families, they go to live in Ziklag. Now, I'm setting up the story. Are you all with me? Yeah. All right. Still into the story? Oh, well, here's what happens. The Philistines actually go to war with the Israelites. Well, they go to war all the time. And, and so as they were going to war, David and his men joined the battle. <clears throat> with the Philistines. So they're now wearing the Philistine, <clears throat> excuse me, territory. Can I get that bottle of water underneath there? You can throw it at me. Thank you. This happens more and more. Does this happen as you get older? <laughs> Y'all didn't have to say that. <laughs> I mean, this was an opportunity to, for you to really shine, but you're like, yeah, you're just getting old. Thank you very much. David and his men, actually, they're a part of the battle that goes out to fight the Israelites. But there were certain leaders in the front. David and Achit, they're in the back of this, this moving army going out to fight the Israelites. And there were certain leaders going, why is he with us? And those guys, you know what's going to happen? We're going to get in the midst of the battle. They're going to turn against us. They're going to kill us and we're going to lose. We don't want him with us. How many of you think that makes some sense? Like, Akish, you might like David, but we remember what he did to us. And we remember him holding up the head, kind of doing a little boasting, like, you're next. And, and, and we don't want that guy with us. And so Akish gathers David and says, David, sorry, these guys don't want you there. They don't understand you like I understand you. David and his men are a little ticked off. But they're told they have to go back. And so they've been away for three days. And so they go back home to Ziklag. That's when the unthinkable happens. So in chapter 30, in verse number 1, three days later, when David and his men arrived home at their town of Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites... Now, I'm going to stop here. The Amalekites. Why would the Amalekites want to do anything to David? Well, you need to understand that what David was doing with his men was raiding these villages. He was creating war against these groups. He would tell the Philistines that he was actually doing war against the Israelites, but he wasn't. He was actually going to the Malachites. By the way, the Malachites seek to get even. It's kind of the problem with violence. Violence leads to what? It's the cycle, isn't it? So they found that the Amalekites had made a raid into the Negev and Ziklag. They had crushed Ziklag and burned it to the ground. So I want you to picture it. They come up over the hill. They look down at their city, and it's smoldering in fire. Everything has been burnt to the ground. It's the unthinkable. It's the worst day of their lives. Because look at verse number 2. They had carried off the women and children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. So as David comes over the hill, his what now I gotta mention it's his wives. Say, Pastor Fred, could you explain why they had more wives in the Old Testament? No. <laughs> not right now. 
I will just give you a word. Can I give you a word? Accommodation. Sometimes God accommodated certain cultures and customs. Doesn't mean he approved. Hello? Okay. Anyway, they carried off. He's kind of looking at me like, that's a topic for another day. Um, You know I don't like to get into controversial topics. (laughs) Okay. Um, Where was I? They came over and they took over the women. Another sign of old age, isn't it? Women and children, gone. I just want to tell you, this is the unthinkable. This is the worst day of their lives. How do they respond? I think as we look at this passage, we see certain ways in which David and his men respond to this tragedy that I think will help us. And some of you may be going, oh, Pastor Fred, I, you know, things are going great in my life. I really hadn't had really anything really bad happen. Hang on. Uh, take the notes to this message and just save it. I- I'm not trying to be, you know, a downer here. I'm just telling you, Jesus said, here we're going to have trouble. And, and we, we do. So how do the men deal with this? How do they handle this situation? And so in your notes, there are just four things. And this is what to do. And I should have put a top on that for you. What to do when the unthinkable happens. What do I do when the unthinkable happens? And this is not an exhaustive list. I just want to give you four things in the time that we have that I think will help you. Number one, you ready? Number one, just write down the word grieve. Weep, grieve. So pick up the story in verse number three. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, say this out loud with me. They wept until they could weep no more. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever experienced crying to where there were no more tears? I mean, you're cried out. You have wept so much, you can't weep anymore. You're just done. You can't reach that point. That's the point. These individuals were thinking about their wives and their children and their families, and they are weeping, and um, I think we understand it. Now, I will tell you that what is uh, not there in the passage that we can assume is definitely there. Because I I will tell you, as a minister, I have arrived on the scene of tragedies. I've been called and have actually come up on the scene of tragedies of all different kinds and different levels. And what I have found is, in most cases, at the moment of the tragedy, people are not crying. They are indeed in shock. And shock is kind of like an anesthetic. It just kind of numbs you all over. Matter of fact, I was reading about a mother who had lost a child, tragically lost a child, and she wrote that at the funeral, she actually ministered to everybody at the funeral because they were all crying and she wasn't. And she said later, she reflected and said, because I was still numb. I actually ministered to everybody, but when all the proceedings were done and I was left at my house alone, the tears came. The shock wore off and then the weeping came. And so after the shock, I'm telling you, when they first came over, there was shock. They're trying to figure this out. They can't believe it. It's disbelief. Have you ever been in a situation where you're just saying to yourself, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. That's where they're at. And then the shock wears off and then they're grieving. Now, um, for sake of time, let me just move on and say this, that uh, here at Eastside, if you're part of the Eastside family, we've got your name on our database, and we know that you've lost somebody in your family, I will send you a booklet on grieving. We've sent out hundreds of these booklets over the years. It's written by a gentleman by the name of Kenneth Hawk, and he writes in the very beginning of that book, and I I put these in your notes. He refers to them as the three ends of grieving and uh, the three ends of grief, And, and I just mention them to you here because I think somebody, this will be beneficial 
Because, listen, we've got to give ourselves permission to grieve. We've got to give ourselves permission to grieve. So here's the first one that he mentions. It just said grief's normal. It's normal. Although, let me say this. Although grieving is normal, there's not a normal way to grieve. Did you, did you understand what I said? We, we all handle grief differently. We will grieve differently, and the time frame in which we grieve will be different. There are so many factors that play into how we grieve, the culture, our environment, our families, our own personalities. By the way, did you know that what I have experienced in the United States is, is that most grieving that takes place, particularly at a funeral service, is very subdued. There is grieving, but it's very quiet and it's very subdued, almost, almost to the point where in the United States, we try to hold it back. Now, if you watch a funeral procession in the Middle East, they don't hold anything back in the funeral. They wail and they scream and they cry. There are portions of scripture that says they actually tear their clothes and beat their chest and set in dust. That was part of their process of grieving. It's not that one's right and one's wrong. I'm just here to tell you that grieving's normal, but be careful not to, to judge how somebody's grieving because we all handle it a little differently. Matter of fact, did you know in the Bible it talks about the fact that in the Middle East, in the time of Jesus, they had professional mourners? Did you know that? I mean, individuals would come over to the home where a death had happened and they would sit around and cry on behalf of the family. Some of you would probably do very well at that job. And I don't think that's a bad thing. That's a good thing. I mean, you're just good at weeping with others who weep. Have you, have you ever just been with somebody that's like, I don't know them, I, I don't know anything about them, but they're just crying also? That's what happened. They had professional mourners. It's normal. The second in in this, uh, according to Dr. Hogg, is that it's natural. Grieving's natural. I guess the best way to say it, it's a human thing, and here's why it's a human thing. Here's why you need permission to grieve. It's natural to grieve because love and grief go together. Do you understand? If you love someone and you lose someone, you're going to grieve because it's tied to the love. Does this make sense? And I will just tell you, it, it's not only connected to people. If you love your pet, yes, even your cat. <laughs> if you love your pet, have you ever lost a pet that's been a part of the family for a long time? I mean, you can grieve. I, listen, you can get really attached to your car. Or your motorcycle. <laughs> there are individuals that have sold their car that they've had ever since they were teenagers and the person's driving off. And I know you're a dude and, and dudes don't cry a lot, but the guy's like... <laughs> and you're like, it's just your car. I love that car. Are you with me? Yeah. It's connected to love. It's natural. And then it's necessary is number three. It's necessary. It's a part of coping. It's a way to release sadness and tension. Do you know there was a lot of grieving that took place in the Bible? There's a lot of grieving in the Bible. Let me just take you to the New Testament. Because Peter was a, Peter was a man's man. You know what I'm saying? I think when we get to heaven we see Peter, we're going to go, you look a lot like Clint Eastwood. <laughs> Peter was a man's man. He just... A, he, do you remember what happened when Peter denied Jesus three times and on the third time Jesus made eye contact with him? Do you remember what Peter did? The Bible says he wept bitterly. Wept. Apostle Paul wept. And how about this verse? It's already up there. John eleven thirty five. 35. Say it with me. Then Jesus wept. Say it without looking at it. 
He just memorized scripture. <laughs> he just did it. All right. So first thing they did was grieved. Write this down for sake of time. We need to move on. Uh, number two, guard against bitterness. Guard against bitterness. Verse number six of that passage says this. David was now in great danger because, okay, say it out loud with me, the red part. All his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters, and they began to talk of stoning him. Bitterness. Well, whenever, let, let me just, let's, can we just get real honest together? Whenever we are hurt, whenever we're hurt, we need to be on guard against bitterness whenever we've been hurt. Because I do believe the evil one loves to move in. This is fertile ground for him to lead us into bitterness. And I just want to say to you, this one strikes really close to home for me right now. I'm not saying this to get your pity, please. I'm just trying to be honest with you so that you will, maybe this will resonate with somebody. Over the past several months, I've had people lie about me, misrepresent me in order to hurt me, to hurt my wife, to hurt my family, and to hurt this church. And I want you to know that I struggle, that hurt, I struggle with bitterness. It, it, it's a struggle. I, I would like to stand up here and tell you that I just started praying immediately for everybody that was hurting me, and I just had this tons of love. But I just want you to know, I do not walk on water. My name is Fred, not Jesus. Are you with me? We're just normal. Bitterness. You want to know what happens when you get bitter? You get cynical and sour. Let me give you some thoughts about bitterness real quick. Since I'm so good at it. I thought this ought to be easy. Well, I do know from the verse that bitterness leads to blaming. Blaming leads to bitterness. I don't know. They just go hand in hand. I will say that. Because you remember what happened? The men started blaming David. They're ready to stone him. They're blaming David. And I just, everybody, will you please hear me right now? Whenever we're hurt, it's easy to blame others. And I will tell you this, there will always, everybody here, this may be the best thing you get today. There will always be somebody to blame. We live in a fallen world, and there will always be somebody to blame. And when you and I begin to blame, then we lose our response ability. Do you understand? Response. Now put those two words together, and what do you have? Responsibility. And so we, we begin to blame others, and we say it's their fault, their fault, their fault, their fault. And then, then we're, we're just left with being cynical and sour, and we're like, not my problem. When it really is our problem, blaming. And by the way, real quick, it's easy to blame God. It's also really easy to blame God. I mean, you say, Pastor Fred, but when I look at situations that are happening, they make no sense. There seems to be no reason whatsoever, and there looks to me like there's no way God could ever bring anything good out of this. And hear me now, just because you and I cannot see a reason, just because we can't see a way God will make good from this, doesn't mean it can't happen. And doesn't mean there isn't a reason. Do we understand? We, we don't know everything. Now, here's the second thing real quick. Write this down. If you are not sure you're bitter, <laughs> ask those closest to you. They'll tell you. Some of you are afraid to. Right now, even at church, you don't even have to ask. Just turn and look. The person next to you might go. <laughs> they might do it a little more like, Be 
people closest to you know. Because when you're full of cynicism and sour, it comes out. And then number three, the antidote to bitterness is forgiveness. I don't have time to develop this. You say, well, Pastor Fred, don't you forgive? I, listen to this. I forgive on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. <laughs> on Tuesdays and Thursdays, those are my bitter days. Now, right now, it's three to two. Making progress. Amen? <laughs> do, you, do, you ever, do you ever wonder why Jesus said that to forgive, you have to forgive 70 times seven? By the way, I think Jesus is saying you have to forgive the same event over and over again. I know forgiveness is a decision in a sense, but I also know that the same event, I can be like, I've given it all to God. And then it's like the next day, i got to give it back again. Anybody relating to this at all? You don't leave me up here hanging. Bitterness is the antidote. It's too big for us to carry. I encourage you to give it to God. Real quick, number three, I'm encouraging you to do this. Seek out support. Seek out support. Now, here's what happens in verse number six, the very last part of this verse. They begin to talk about stoning David, but, say it with me, David found strength or support in the Lord his God. Now, you say, well, he didn't have anybody else. Well, maybe so. It does appear that there was nobody else. But that, listen, I've seen individuals that seem to have everything go against them. They still don't turn to God. At least David did turn back to God. And how many of you know this is a difference? There's a difference between 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, and 1 Samuel 27, verse 1, where he's trying to figure it out himself. Now he's turned back to God. He's encouraged himself in God. And you're saying, well, Pastor Fred, can, can I encourage myself in God? Yes. Yes, find support. And here, let me, let me just tell you, here's how God su will, will support us. Here's how our Father will support us. God will support us through our own prayer and reading of Scripture. How many of you have experienced this? You've experienced in times of prayer or Scripture that God just seems to encourage our hearts. He will encourage us through, uh, you know what? God has talented, given talents to individuals to minister in music. And God will use books and he will use podcasts. And by the way, he might use a sermon. He might use church. Church. You want to know why it's so important for us to be here? Because we need this. We need support. The more you are away from this, the weaker you will become. We need support. But let me tell you one of the shh, dirty little secrets about church. <laughs> Not everybody that's going to church, that's carrying a Bible, not every one of those people are encouragers. Some of them are cranky. <laughs> and they will get their crank all over you. <laughs> Sometimes there's nothing worse than a cranky Christian. Here's what I encourage you to do. When you need strength and support, you get around people who are at least a little bit optimistic. Because if you get around people who are just negative and all they can say is negative stuff, you will soon be negative. Get away from the cranky. Some of you are like, i got to move right now then, Pastor. <laughs> what do you do if you're married to cranky? Whole other sermon. Don't have that. <laughs> and also, let me just remind you of something. Well, Pastor Fred, I came to church and I was hurting and I was in one of those one unthinkable scenarios and I sat down next to somebody at your church and they didn't even smile or help me. By the way, how do you know they're not going through an unthinkable? We ought to be friendly, obviously, but people are going through stuff. Would you agree? So let's be careful. Seek out support. Let me give you one last thing. 
I go here a lot because this is very important to me. I want you to refuse to believe that God's mad at you. Now, don't put your notes away yet. Hang on. I'm going to let you out on time, so relax. What typically happens for many of you and many of us, particularly if we were raised in a church that was performance-based, the moment things start going wrong in our life, we immediately think God is punishing us. Some of you right now, this very moment, there are things happening in your life that isn't pleasant and your conclusion is God is punishing me. That's what you think. You say, but Pastor Fred, I I read the Bible. I read how God can't tolerate sin, and sin is really bad. And and I read it over and over and over again. That's right. I read the Old Testament. I read Elijah, and I read what the Bible says. But that's not the whole story. Let me give you the whole story. Sin is bad. God can't tolerate sin, but he didn't tolerate sin. He intervened in our mess. He left heaven, came down here. He took our sin upon himself, and he condemned sin on our behalf. There's nothing left to condemn Jesus said, I didn't come here to condemn you, but to save you and to rescue you and to deliver you. I hear, listen, God's, can I tell some of you are like, well, why would God love me? Listen to me. I'm going to tell you why God would love you because God is your father. You want to know what Jesus revealed when he came? Nobody else revealed this because nobody else knew it. Jesus said, nobody knows the Father but me. And Jesus referred to him as Father, not just God. (laughs) He's Father. Why does God love you? Because he's your Father, knucklehead. (laughs) He's your Father. And if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly Father will give to you. The temptation when the unthinkable happens is to think God's mad at you and that God's punishing you. But I'm here to tell you, here's the good news. Jesus took all of that. Jesus took it. Do we serve a great God or what? You don't have to live in fear. Because as the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. You doing good? What do you do when the unthinkable happens? What do we do? Well, yeah, we need to grieve. We need to guard against Bitterness, we need to seek out support and refuse the temptation that the evil one will place in our minds that God is mad at you. Here's what I'll tell you God's not mad at you, He's mad about you. Oh, that's tweetable. Let's bow our heads together. Right now would be a good time just as you're seated. Just to say yes to him. Maybe somebody in the room, you came, you said, you know what, I've never allowed God to work in my life. Let him, tell him, tell him right now that you believe him. Tell him right now that you confess him as Lord. Tell him right now that you accept his acceptance of you and what he has done on your behalf. Father, we thank you so much for what we have learned today as we look into this story in the life of David, how he had the worst day of his life was the unthinkable. And David and his men 
they showed us and gave us encouragement and hope. We weep. We guard against bitterness. We seek support from you. And you often support through other people. Father, we thank you so much that you're not mad at us, but that you love us. And I pray that each and every one here would confess you as their Lord and their Savior. Encourage us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people again said, now don't get up and walk out yet. Hang on. <laughs>